Before he was VP candidate, J.D. Vance made his name in D.C. That's venture capitalism. He says he launched businesses specifically to help families like his back home. But those who knew him say his career wasn't much to write home about. Vance spent less than five years as a venture capitalist in Silicon Valley, moving between three different firms and pouring money into one big investment, a company that went bankrupt. In an interview with The Wall Street Journal, one former colleague who worked with Vance during his stint at a firm owned by Peter Thiel, his big political backer, claims they never even saw Vance in the office. But he has leaned into this part of his bio on the campaign trail, the successful venture capitalist. And tonight, he returned to Silicon Valley for a fundraiser at the private home of a cryptocurrency executive. Joining me now to discuss, Teddy Schleifer, who covers campaign finance for The New York Times, and Brian Schwartz, CNBC political finance reporter. Brian, here's the thing. Less than five years, not even as a venture capitalist, just working in the industry, okay? He did not have some big baller VC career we're talking about. So what is the success story that should make him worthy of being our vice president, right? He didn't have a big booming business career. He didn't have a long political career. So what's he selling us? Well, I mean, what he's selling you is that short-lived career, and he's being able to take that that story and leverage that for relationships that have been helping him his political career for years. You talk about Peter Thiel. This is somebody who put millions of dollars behind his run for Senate. You know, Thiel also put money behind, you know, Blake Masters when he went up against Mark Kelly and lost. But, you know, J.D. Vance was his guy and continues to be his guy in a way. And and so however man, how many years he's been doing this, and I, I know that I've read the journal story, and how, I think I mentioned, as you said, that, you know, somebody who talked to the journal said he didn't even see Vance in the office and in, 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 when he worked at the firm that, that Thiel founded. I mean, so, you know, at the end of the day, however long he was there, how little time he might have been working, how much time he was working as a venture capitalist, he's been able to leverage those relationships. And I think that's also the reason why he's in Silicon Valley tonight, Stephanie. And that's the question why. If he didn't have some big, giant, successful career, why exactly is he able to leverage those relationships. What do those people know about him? What can they control in him that they can get? Teddy, you've written a lot about this. And one of the companies he founded, APP Harvest, was sued by its investors just months after Vance left the board because he was running for Senate. And they sued the company because they claimed they were misled. That company went bankrupt last year when J.D. Vance was one year in office as a junior senator in Ohio. What exactly is this man hanging his hat on? His story that Brian talks about, does it check out? I mean, I think what we got to understand about his career in venture capital is this was happening at the exact same time of his book. Um, the book came out, Hillbilly Elegy, just around the time that he began his tenure at Mithril, um, which uh, it's impossible to separate kind of the fame he achieved a a as an author and, you know, you might have mm -hmm. a, your your critique of his venture capital career, but as a as a literary figure, you know he, his book was a massive success um, and mm -hmm. it enhances credibility. And, and the reason what he's he's running for president today, vice president today, and was elected to the U.S. Senate is not because of his VC career, but it's because of Hillbilly Elegy, which you know was of course made into a successful Netflix movie, and uh, you know he became a, a well known figure for his critique of Trump, for his uh, you know uh, lectures about working class America, uh, and I. I don't really think about him as a VC who ran for political office. I think about him as a media personality who ran for political office, because that's why he was able to become such an integral part of the Republican infrastructure and establishment in Ohio. And when you listen to why Trump chose him, he's yes, he talks a little bit about his career in VC, but even Trump knows that you don't become a famous VC with five years uh, in Silicon Valley, but you can certainly become a famous media figure with one hit book. I would think the main uh, qualification or the main job that J.D. Vance has had is not VC, but author. It's an extraordinary book, and it, it, it awakened us, uh, many people, to this sleeping giant in parts of the country, this forgotten America. But J.D. Vance isn't running on any policies that help that part of America. And if that is who he wants to help, why is it, Brian, that all these luminaries in the world of tech and, and Silicon Valley why do they want to back him? Because they're not actually interested in the Rust Belt of America.
Well, because they're they're telling Trump and Vance are saying some of the things they all want to hear, right? When I I listened back uh, to Donald Trump's speech, for instance, uh, at the Nashville Bitcoin conference, I know we're talking about tech here, but the same jam. And basically, you know, the things <laughs> that Trump touched on were were you know firing Gary Gensler right, when he becomes president, you know, putting together this you know Bitcoin set of experts to guide policy. This is, you know, all the, the things that some people who own crypto, especially executives who invest in, in the crypto space, have been wanting to hear for years since Joe Biden became president, since Gary Gensler became the chair of the SEC. Now, I don't know if that message is resonating with everybody. I still think there are some people in the tech world and the crypto space who are very much open to listening and hearing out the vice president, Vice President Harris. Um, but it certainly is resonating with enough people that when you watch back that speech that Trump made, Trump had in Nashville, you know, there was a standing ovation for certain certain parts of that, particularly the part where he took aim at Gensler directly. So I think what they're doing here is they're just saying some of the things that some of these folks have just wanted to hear, uh, frankly, at the end of the day, whether or not Trump and J.D. Vance go ahead with any of these policy proposals, if they be, if they get in the White House again, remains to be clear, to be quite frank. And and you've got to wonder what J.D.'s ideology is going to be, because people who don't like Gary Gensler detest Lena Khan. And while he has been a senator, um, J.D. Vance has been a huge supporter uh, of what she has done. Teddy, but not everybody, because I, I want to be clear, not everybody in the world of tech and in the, in, in the VC world is backing Trump and J.D. Vance. We're actually seeing sort of political brawls within Silicon Valley kind of spill out into public view. Just the other day, I interviewed Reid Hoffman, co-founder of LinkedIn, who is backing Kamala Harris in a big, big way, and with the likes of Ron Conway and others pulling a big coalition together to do the same. It's where Kamala Harris is from. Tell us what's happening here. Mm -hmm. Sure, I, I think people right. I, I think people got to understand the culture of Silicon Valley and how rare this is. Um, you know, a lot of these people went to college together. Um, they went; they were in each other's weddings. They're all about the same age. Lots of them are white men, which we should note. I mean, these are a group of people who became billionaires together. Isn't that sweet? Um, and now, over the last, I would say, really beginning around the time of COVID, um, but it feels like especially so now. Um, during the Trump presidency, uh, sorry, during, during the Trump uh, re-election campaign, um, we're seeing the, these friends have these beefs. And, you know, look, people have strongly held political beliefs about the world and about issues like abortion or issues like AI. And, you know, people are entitled to their own beliefs. But you've seen people like Elon Musk um, go after Reid Hoffman's ties to Jeffrey Epstein. Um, you've seen David Sachs call other people idiots um, uh, and these are these aren't just like random people they know on the internet. These are folks who they would have called their friends a couple years ago. And look, politics is at a fever pitch, and you know, uh, to some extent, you know, we're just we're just seeing the billionaire version of kind of the way that all of our friendships have been transformed by politics over the last couple of years. But um, as someone who's been in Silicon Valley for or was in Silicon Valley for seven years, it, it's, it's remarkable to see just these fissures between people who you know were in each other's weddings. Just because you're rich doesn't mean you're decent. Teddy, Brian, thank you both for being here.